Everything else can wait, but the search for God cannot wait, and love one another. Those were the last words spoken by George Harrison, my favorite Beatle and one of my spiritual mentors, someone whom I love and admire very much, who passed away 20 years ago today. Now, I'll be um, reading and fleshing out a little bit from the blog post, which I published today. Some of the things I had to cut out of my blog post for the sake of relative brevity, but I might mention them here as well. The 30th of November, 2001, is one of those days I shall remember in exact detail from start to finish forever. Indelible ink written upon my heart and soul. That was the day the world found out George Harrison had dropped the body and left the material world. Though he passed on on the 29th, the news didn't break until the morning of the 30th. Everyone had known for a while that George was dying of brain cancer, so it wasn't a huge shock, as it was when people like um, John Entwistle, Davy Jones, and Peter Tork had passed on. One of the ladies on my estrogen who lists which the, it was, we called the, um, the all-female Yahoo groups devoted to the Who. Almost all of us were in our 20s and teens, I believe. We did have a somewhat older um, token male, but he was, like, pretty cool and respectful. But other than that, it was all um, women. And this um, girl, her name was um, Nicolette. She even had a dream that George was going to die on the 30th. I just knew it. Friday, the 30th of November, 2001. I went right to the communal TV in one of the little upstairs lounges of the Hillel House, where I lived my senior year of UMass. That's the... Jewish um, communal center for um, Jewish communal life. It's a very interesting story. That building before it became the Hillel House, it was a fraternity that got busted for some pretty nasty hazing and I think like about 88 um, barrels of alcohol at a party back in the late 80s. And before it was a fraternity, it was a sorority that got busted for prostitution. So it's had quite a storied history, that building. And sure enough, the morning news was announcing George's death. Very appropriately, it was raining that day. I walked to my first class of the day, second year Russian, which started at um, 10 in the morning. My classes were a bit later senior because I do like to sleep a bit. I arrived a bit late to class, but it wasn't unreasonably inexcusable, like maybe just like, you know, five, ten minutes or so. All the while, everything felt so surreal, the kind of feeling that can't be recreated. It's just something you intensely sense while it's happening, a particular feeling that only comes this way once and then never again. All day I thought about George, but I was unable to cry or even get misty-eyed. His death wasn't a bolt from out of the blue. Everyone expected it and knew it would be sooner rather than later. Only when I was in the computer lab in the library in the very late afternoon and reading the lyrics of I Need You did I finally begin to tear up a little. And I obviously did have my own computer, but it was 1993 Mac, so the internet wasn't particularly like good, like not like modern internet, so I had to go to the computer lab. I believe it was on the 23rd floor in those days. It's on a different floor of the library since I've graduated, and so that I would basically go there for a few hours to have some internet and do a little typing as well. But even after reading those um, lyrics and getting a bit um, misty-eyed, I was still unable to properly cry for George for many years, and I don't know if this is just like a me thing or it being you know, the, the way my... um brain is wired, not from a touchy-feely family, etc., but I'm just not very, like, emotionally expressive. I don't easily, like, cry in public or, like, to show my emotions, things like that. Maybe it's, well, that's, like, a topic for a whole other thing, but basically I'm just not, like, a touchy-feely person, just part of who I am. It's not, like, that I did, wasn't sad or, like, upset or, like, very, like, emotionally, like, intense. It was just, I just couldn't cry for it. You know, people often can feel emotions but not express them so it's not someone who isn't crying about like the death of someone they really love and admire that doesn't mean they're not you know feeling those emotions it's just crying isn't the way they personally show those emotions all the time before going home i went to the campus center to buy tickets for the upcoming hillel semi-formal which um, my um that was the first time i had actually gone to any sort of dance my um friend rachel one of um probably like four or five rachels i was friends with that year because it's such a common name for um, Jewish women my age. We had, like, gone out, had a really fun night one evening, and she, like, told, when she, like, dropped me back off at the Hillel House, like, said, you know, you're really sweet. You should, like, be, like, putting yourself out more. But just, you know, I was, unfortunately, bullied in junior high, and that led me to not, you know, wanting, like, social life, and I felt like oh, maybe if I put myself out there and people notice me, they'll, I'll be a target for bullies again. So I basically really, really withdrew and, like, basically didn't like social life at all. I basically just, you know, kept to myself super like introverted things like that even more than I naturally already am and she said you know let's you know put yourself out there start having fun and like enjoying like you know university and the community here and yeah I did I did went to the semi-formal it was wonderful you didn't need a date it was just like totally not like the junior high dances but anyway that I was um 
going to the campus center to buy my tickets for the semi-formal that um, evening. And on a wall near the ticket booth, someone had put up a picture of George with his years lived, one of his quotes, and a thank you. Everything still felt so surreal. That night at services, I said Kaddish for George. The, the traditional custom is to only say Kaddish for immediate relatives and um, Jewish relatives at that, obviously. I've always said it for special people whom I feel a deep and abiding love for. I also say Yizkor for them, which is a memorial prayer said it um, during um, Passover, um, Shavuot, um, Shemini, Atzeret, and um, Yom Kippur. It's uh, not like Kaddish, but it's very similar, like a just little um, service memorializing people. And I also yeah, I say, George is one of the people I um, say Yizkor for, and I've never understood the Orthodox custom of only saying Yizkor for parents. There are many people we grieve. The Orthodox custom is if, I mean, Ashkenazic Orthodox, but I don't necessarily think that like Sephardim and Mizrahim and other um, Jewish communities do this. It's to, if you have two living parents, you have to leave the synagogue or at least the room because of like a superstition, the angel of death might get confused or like, God forbid, come for your parents, but like, but when you go to like, like a conservative reform or even maybe like a liberal modern orthodox synagogue, you're allowed to stay there because they recognize like parents are not the only people we grieve. Like for example, I say um, Yizkor for my um, three grandparents who are now in the other world. My um, dear uncle who was killed in the car accident when I was eight years old. My um, great grandmother Alice and like a few other um, special people in my life who I'm, uh, I admire and like maybe friends and things like that if there's enough time. But anyway, like George is one of those like special people I've always been saying Kaddish for since he passed away and also in, including in my Yizkar prayers because, you know, you have to be kind of like have a heart of stone to think, oh, the only people you would want to say Yizkar for, like say Kaddish for, have to be your like, parents or very immediate relatives because that's just not, you know, reality for most people. We mourn lots of different people. That night, I watched VH1 on the communal TV. This was obviously before it was um, Shomeret Shabbat, um, guardian of Sabbath. That's the female form of the word. The male form is Shomer Shabbat, then you, which you don't like use electricity and do a lot of other things on the Sabbath. And obviously, like if the television is already on, you can watch it if someone put it on because some of my Orthodox friends did watch television like that on the Sabbath, like if they were like, you know, like walking by or something and like the news was already on, someone forgot to turn the television off, they would just sit down and watch. And so um, VH1 was doing a tribute to George, like playing clips from a recent appearance like, with interview he had made on one of their shows and I'm um, playing a new song, and he wrote. I believe he might have played a couple of his other new songs too. And that song became the opening track on his final, his posthumous final album, Brainwash, which I think I gave a 3.5 review to. I can do that in another blog if you're interested. And um, Any Road also became one of his signature songs. As the chorus says, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there, which is so true about so many things throughout life. Any, afterwards, I went to my room and wrote in my journal, Rael. I um, name all of my journals since the um, third journal, Cecilia. They've all been um, named after songs. I can also do another vlog about how I name my journals. My current journal is named Mary. It was my first anniversary with my fourth Who album, Odds and Sods, which is like a, not, not rarities, I would say, just like, you know, bits and bobs, odds and sods they hadn't used yet on other albums, and they just like put it out because they needed to do an album. And um, in those days, I always did a special journal entry for my album anniversaries, which I've long since discontinued because it was taking up way too much of my like time and journaling like space. My thoughts about George came first, and the first few lines of that entry were all in caps. Everything still felt so surreal. When George passed, John was my favorite Beatle. Paul was originally my favorite for very superficial reasons, like I thought he was the cutest, which of course that's how a lot of 13 year olds think, even ones who are deeper than like their peers and deeper for their age than I like, like to think of myself as I was then. But my um, emotional attachment to John began manifesting in December 93, and by the spring of 94 it was obvious he had become my favorite. For the next few years I tried to pretend I had two favorites, but in my heart I knew John was my only favorite felt so good when I finally admitted that to my journal Rita in the summer of 97. I never ever expected to change favorites again. For quite some time, I'd considered George my favorite solo Beatle, but still saw John as my favorite overall. John was more than just my favorite Beatle, but my hero, the person I admired most, someone whom I talked to during some of the darkest nights of my soul, almost like praying. To this day, I believe down to the very core of my soul that I might have taken my own life in eighth grade, if not for my love of the Beatles. And I have mentioned before I suffer from like, cyclical depression. I'm not sure if like I already had it and it, that was just happened to like overlap with a time, the situational and cyclical, or if that 
trigger like cyclical depression in the future, but it has never been like mentally that bad. I have never like, God forbid, contemplated even like in passing suicide ever since then. My depression has always been functional, even at its um, worst of times. And it's probably always something I will um, suffer with throughout my life, but I, I do know how to manage it. And like, even when it's like at really, really bad, like it's been a few times in the past, I'm able to, you know, like go out and function and do things. It's not like a suicidal depression for me at all. And that's like something I it's m much better than it has was in the eighth grade because I'm, you know, older and know how to like manage things better now. So it was one of the saddest days of my life when I realized John was no longer my favorite Beatle and that George had replaced him quite a few years ago. And similarly, it was also very sad in late 2000 for me when I like figured out that The Who had become my favorite band and The Beatles were no longer my favorite band because I do, as I mentioned, believe I owe my life to them and they are still the musical love of my life even though they are no longer my uh, favorite band. The Who is still my favorite band. I had l was listening much more to George's solo work than John's and I felt George to be more of a kindred spirit because of our similar beliefs and interests. Let's be honest, I've always been a quiet one myself. People tend to gravitate to others like themselves. Sometimes your heart also knows something before your mind is ready to admit it, and they have to be in harmony together. I truly consider George one of my spiritual mentors. His personal relationship with the divine was so beautiful and inspiring. Because of him, many times when I made personal prayers after the Amidah, the long central prayer of Jewish services, I addressed God as my sweet Lord, and I used the past tense instead of the present tense because I've unfortunately been able to go to synagogue in person since lockdown began in March 2020, and there are a lot of prayers you can't say without a minion, a, a quorum of 10 people in the live streaming service isn't the same as being there actually in person with people, but hopefully someday, God willing, sooner rather than later, I will be able to finally go to synagogue in person again. It's hard to put into words everything George means to me, what a truly special, beautiful, incredible person he was. But at the heart of it, he just most deeply speaks to the type of person I've developed into. He would never have felt right as my favorite Beatle in my teens or 20s, and I do firmly believe John needed to be my favorite Beatle at that time in my life, just like George needs to be my favorite Beatle now. It's just, you know, who I was then and who I am now. It's just, you know, right for the kind of person I've been in those different times in my life. And maybe I really am slowly turning into my mother as I get older, since George was her favorite, too. I love George so much because he was such a deeply spiritual person, but not sectarian or preachy, contrary to what certain people think. Like, just he has so many beautiful songs or, like, like love songs to God and, like, saying, like, this is what I believe, you know, take it or leave it. I'm not, you know, forcing you to be like this or, like, thinking you're, like, an inferior heathen if you don't share my beliefs. His 1981 song, Life Itself, which is on the album um, Somewhere in England, starts out seeming like a love song to his wife, Olivia. Then it becomes apparent it's truly a love song to the divine, with a beautiful line. They call you Christ, Vishnu, Buddha, Jehovah, our Lord. You are Govindam, Bismillah, creator of all. He did all he could to help the starving people of Bangladesh. And if you ever heard the, the, um, the title song for the concert for Bangladesh, just so beautiful this like emotional anguished cry from the heart to help these um wonderful like people who are like you know starving through no fault of their own and like begging the people in the concert and watching at home to just you know do something to help them because it's our moral imperative to like help those in need when we are able to he did a lot of good work for unicef he proved that still waters run very very deep he had such a beautiful personal relationship with the divine all things must pass and living in the material world some of the most beautiful spiritual albums ever, and I highly, highly, highly recommend them there. All Things Must Pass is my um, second favorite album after only The Who's Quadrophenia, and I, with Living in the Material World, that might be somewhere in my top ten, I, I would say. They're just like such wonderful, lovely, beautiful, spiritual, deep albums. I would like highly recommend them to anybody and possibly also do some reviews of them in future. He remained interested in Indian music, philosophy, and religion long after it was no longer a trend. His interest was serious and genuine, not based on popular fads. Although you can also kind of hear in like some of his songs and things he was saying like shortly after he got interested, he did have a bit of convert zeal, but he, and he gradually like toned it down as he like became more like intent, not intense, like you know, committed or like just in the beliefs for longer. And he was more settled into them, no longer trying to you know prove to himself and others, look what a wonderful like religious or spiritual person I am. All into this, he just you know settled into like a more natural expression of those beliefs and didn't like do it like in your face as much as he had done maybe a little bit when he was just getting into it and 
first time I heard the um, song Within You Without You shortly after I turned 14, which is the George's song on a Sgt. Pepper, which is, a, I believe, the most overrated album at, of all time. That's another story for another topic. But when I heard George's song, it was like this um, mystical, like, secret world to another, a door to another world had opened up and, like, opened my eyes to these, these things I had never thought possible before. And I've also been very interested in, like, Indian spirituality ever since and religion, all those wonderful things George was interested in. He had such a beautiful soul and kind heart. He didn't crave the limelight and was content to live away from the media. His 1979 eponymous album is so full of joy, happiness, and inner peace. And I would also highly recommend that album. It's very, very good and such wonderful, like, personal songs. And he's also, like, celebrating finally becoming a daddy on, like, one of the songs he wanted to become a father for a long time, but unfortunately didn't happen in his first marriage. And his um, second wife, Olivia, they finally had a baby together. George was 36 when he became a father, and if, you know, he became, like, a parent much later than he would have liked, maybe there's still hope for me yet. I will be fertile, God willing, for about 10 more years, so maybe I can have a baby after all. He had so much faith in humanity to do the right thing and positively change the world and ourselves. He had such a positive, upbeat attitude. He did not fear death at all, was totally surrendered to, and peaceful about his approaching end. George once said, the only difference between the dead and the living is that the dead no longer breathe. The soul continues on, just in another form. And although I personally am not really, never been into Monty Python, maybe some of their skits and songs I've liked, but they're just not really my style of humor. But George did help to give them their big break by helping to like foot their bill for some of their movies. So if you like uh, Monty Python, you can um, thank George for that, for like helping to bring them into the, the spotlight and giving them, you know, the financial resources to do what they wanted until they had some more fans and didn't have to rely so much on people like helping them behind the scenes. May you rest in eternal peace with our sweet Lord, dear Georgie Kind, and may your beautiful memory be for an eternal blessing. The world is a better place because you were in it for 58 years, and I feel so blessed we shared planet Earth for 21 years. In 11 months. So if you watch to the end, um, thank you very much. Um, George has been a, a very um, special person to my life for so many years, even long before he um, became my favorite Beatle. It's his something, a big influence who will be in my life forever. I highly recommend his le wonderful, beautiful, um, spiritual solo albums and his um, work with the Beatles also is um, very good too. He got um, better as he like went along and then finally when he was able to work as a solo artist all this wonderful beautiful music he had been keeping under wraps just finally came blasting out. So like if you are a fan of George I encourage you to listen to some of his music today and just um, think about him. My next vlog I will try to possibly put it out on um, Friday, December 3rd, because that's my um, Hebrew birthday, the fifth night of Hanukkah. It starts on the night of December 2nd and goes until December 3rd, because when you're, it's your Hebrew birthday, you have the power to bless others and receive blessings. And I would like to um, bless these guys um, by putting out a vlog on my birthday. Possibly it will be uh, one of my um, Dantean posts now that I finally have the capacity to add some images into my vlog. So thank you very much for listening and see you guys soon. Thanks. Bye.